going through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm really glad to see you in the Lord's house today. And glad to have those of you who are worshiping with us uh, at home, uh, Lin Linda and um, Lisa and Larry and Paul. I feel like we're on her room here. So <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're watching us. It's wonderful. Well, you know, my very first congregation in Minnesota was in Norwegian farmland country there. So there they used to tell us Sven and Oli jokes, or the Oli and yeah. Nina jokes, right? I remember the, the one about the time Oli and Lena go to church, and as they're coming home, Oli's just feeling so good, and puts his arm around Lena in the in the car on the way home, and they get home, and she goes inside to make him a sandwich, and he's standing out, and he says, Lord, why did you make Lena so round and soft and pleasant for me to hold? And this voice comes down from heaven, and it says, I made her that way so that you would love her. And Oli's kind of shocked. He thinks for a second, and he says, Lord, why did you make her not so smart. <laughs> the voice comes down from heaven and says, I made her that way so that she would love you. <laughs> I love those holy and lean jokes. But when we, uh, when we talk about a group of people, whether it's Norwegians or anyone else, uh, uh, you're kind of drawing out the fact that there are sometimes groups of people, distinctions that we make here in the earthly kingdom, um, that we're, we're, we're kind of looking at some people askance, right? Does the Bible do that at all? That's going to come up in our gospel text today, so I'm really glad that you're here and will be able to, to learn and share with me. Our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, is printed right in the bulletin. We discovered that when we went to two services, we, had, we started having to disinfect the church then twice before each service, and um, somebody felt that um, all that disinfectant maybe was helping, causing the hymnals to, to wear down a little faster. I think that was probably a, a good catch. So rather than use the hymnals, we're just going to start printing the hymns right there in the bulletins for you. So I hope you don't, don't mind that change. Hopefully that's temporary and we can go back the way things were soon. Uh, so our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, will stand on the last verse. <laughs>
say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, mercy has given his son to die for you, and for your sake forgives you all of your sin. As a call and ordained servant of the Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> rejected his people by 
by no means. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you know that what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left. They seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full include be me? Now I am speaking to you, Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean? dead. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the whole root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant for the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through the faith. So do not become proud, but fail. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, providing you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these the natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts of the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they, too, have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please rise for the verse and remain standing for the reading of the gospel? Alleluia. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Alleluia. Holy 
Holy Gospels according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. He did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated for the day. My car is on the fritz. 
Your car is on the fritz? Yeah, yeah, my car is on the fritz. Well, that's not really an emergency now, is it? Please don't call this number again. And they hang up. And the camera kind of pans around, and his car is over his friend Fritz that had ran over him. <laughs> you know, we all knew, didn't we, when jokes went too far or were wrong, but otherwise we could enjoy humor about Germans, or about rednecks, or about Stash, or about Sven and Oli, or Oli and Lena was innocent, there's no need to get all worked up about it, but you have to be careful now, right? Because people are so hypersensitive. The world is so inflamed with tension. We unfortunately live in a day where tribalism really is out of control. There's, there's identity politics. I, I was listening to a, a, a one prominent thinker and societal observer the other day, and I thought he made a great point. He said, you know, natural law and religion have always served to help people gain meaning, shared values, purpose, and that enables us to live in larger societal groups. And as we've undermined those things, people have had to try to find meaning for themselves. And so they, they seek it in smaller groups, pushing the boundaries of normal uh, behavioral uh, be norms, and, they, and they're forming these tribes of, of like-minded people. And the only thing they have in common is that they stand firmly against everybody else who's not like them. We see this being displayed right in front of us now in the national events and, and all the crazy uh, gender varieties that are showing up, right? All these special concerns that won't tolerate any kind of opposition and this fragmenting is happening all around us. And so that's why I felt like it was important before I get into my text to just touch on a couple of overarching biblical truths that we really need to have as the backdrop for all of this. One is that all people ultimately are descended from Adam and Eve, and all share the same human nature. There is no such thing as the black race, or the white race, or the Asian race, or the Native American race, or the Jewish race. There really is only the human race. When Dawn and I visited the Ark Encounter last year down in Kentucky, which, by the way, I highly recommend. If you ever get a chance to go, you really should go. But they were promoting a book there by Ken Ham called One Race, One Blood, which looks at how Darwinism and Darwinian evolution theory has played a prominent role in really inciting and aggravating racism as opposed to the biblical idea that we are all like and we all come from the same source. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good book, I need to get that. <laughs> Secondly, not only are we all alike in origin and nature, but the gospel of Jesus Christ, in which he died for our sins and redeemed us from the curse of the law, that is a universal gospel. Now, I'm not talking about universalism in the sense that everybody, no matter who they are, what they believe, all ends up in the same place. But it's universal in the sense that Christ died for all. His promises are extended to all. There's no human being to whom we should not preach the gospel because it somehow doesn't apply to them. It applies to everybody. So with those two truths as the backdrop for God's revelation, disclosure to us, what I want to do, based on our gospel text today, is look at some of the distinctions that existed between people and how that did, in fact, play a role in the unfolding of God's salvation history over time. And we'll learn a lot from it, I think. But not only will you learn something, I feel like if you stay with me on this, you're going to comprehend God's love for you in a more personal and more experiential way. You want, a, you want a more of a first-person insider connection to understand just where you stand with God, not just to know about it, but to know it? Well, then look at this text with me. That's how God does it, through word and sacrament. I think he's going to do it here. I really do. I believe it's going to happen. So here's our story. Jesus has had a conflict with the Pharisees at the beginning of chapter 15. And so where our story today picks up, he's got to get away from there for a little bit. Things are heating up too fast. It's not yet time for him to be crucified. He knows that's coming, but it's too early. So he leaves the country, and he goes about 50 miles west by northwest of, the, of Galilee uh, to the district of Tyre and Sidon. That is modern-day Lebanon, where they just had that explosion a few days ago. 
And while he's there, we're told that a Canaanite woman comes to him, crying for mercy. And she wants his help because her daughter is being oppressed by a demon. It says, severely oppressed. I don't know what form this oppression was taking, how that was manifesting. It could be all sorts of things. Demons find all sorts of ways, if they can, to, to interfere with your life. That's one th why one thing I do is I recommend that periodically you, you make the affirmation that was made in your baptism. To say, I renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways. You should say that every so often. Out loud, you should. You might be surprised how many little physical things or anxiety things or just bad luck things might start to, to dissipate a little bit. I, we, don't, we don't know, but I think it will help, so you should do it. But this woman comes to Jesus for help because it's clearly so bad for her daughter. And do you know what Jesus does? Verse 23. He did not answer her a word. I remember years ago, I flew into Phoenix. I'm at the baggage claim in the Phoenix airport. And guess who else flies in? The New York Knicks. They, they came into town to, to play Phoenix. And this little girl, not, not a teenager, a little girl, goes up to Patrick Ewing. You can't miss him. He's seven feet tall, right? She goes up to Patrick Ewing and asks for an autograph. And she's standing there holding up a paper and a pen like this. Patrick Ewing did not give her an autograph. He did not look at her. He did not say a word to her. He intentionally stood there, looking straight out, ignoring her, for a very awkward 30 seconds while she's holding this up to him, until finally another one on the next team came over and said, here, I'll sign that for you, honey. What a jerk. <laughs> I, I never liked Patrick Huey, but I especially disliked him after I, after I observed him. That's what Jesus does here in our town doesn't say a word to her. What's going on here? Well, the disciples come, and they beg him to send her away because she keeps bothering them. Now, they're not just saying to her, tell her to go away. Okay, tell her to go away. They're saying, Jesus, give her what she wants so that she'll go away. How do I know that? Because it's the only context to make any sense other than the next thing that comes from Jesus' mouth. He responds to the disciples, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, I can't give her what she wants because that's not what I'm here for. He, he did not come to do miracles and deliverance and ministry for the Gentiles, only for the Jewish people. So now we can't escape this crucial reality of the Bible. That all people may be the same in terms of the unfolding of salvation across history. But God did not deal with everybody in the same way. He had chosen the Jews. And he worked in and with and ultimately through the Jews first. They were the original olive tree and were the grafted in branches. He, he, does, he did that in order to bring about Christ and the gospel. And so it wasn't really until Pentecost and the birth of the church that the earthly ministry of Jesus was completed. And God's outreach now goes beyond the Jews as an outreach to the whole world. So this just doesn't sound like the kind of Jesus we know. He's not answering her a word. But it's clear that Jesus is not going to be bothered by this woman. It's worse than that. Matthew also makes the point of telling us that this woman was a Canaan. Now, I've talked about this in Sunday school. So here's my little plug. Every Sunday I put in a plug for going to Sunday school because you'll learn so much. But as you learn more and more about what's in the Bible and how the parts of the Bible all fit together, here's what you should think about right away as soon as I tell you that she is a Canaanite. That the Canaanites were not even supposed to be alive. When God gave the promised land to the children of Israel, the Canaanites were one of seven nations that God said were devoted to destruction. In other words, every last one of them was supposed to be exterminated. Now people can self-righteously criticize the Bible for promoting ethnic cleansing. But God is making it clear in the Old Testament that not only would the Canaanites entice the Israelites to 
practice false worship if they were allowed to remain, but also that the Canaanites were so wicked that they were to be destroyed as part of God's punishment to them. The Old Testament lists terrible sins that Israel was commanded not to practice. Horrible idolatry, every kind of sexual perversion that you can think of, and some that you probably never would have thought of, and even child sacrifice. And then God says in the Old Testament that the Canaanites and the other six nations that were to be destroyed and displaced when the Israelites came into the Promised Land it was because they did all those things and practiced them regularly. So some self-righteous atheists may want to criticize the Bible about that. But the point it's trying to make here is that a holy God is a holy God. And this holy God is no kidding life and death serious about sin. The Canaanites sin, the atheists sin, our sin. So the Canaanites should have been exterminated. And the only reason that this Canaanite woman is standing here talking to Jesus 1,400 years after the fact is that the Israelites failed to do what God wanted them to do. They didn't destroy the Canaanites, and they ended up falling into the same idolatries and sins that, that they practice. But this woman shouldn't even But when Jesus says that he is sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Instead of getting insulted at this woman, instead of organizing a protest march and carrying a sign that says, Canaanite lives matter, <laughs> instead of filing a lawsuit, or instead of lodging a hate crime complaint, or instead of going down the street to the Metropolitan Canaanite Church where she can be appreciated for who she is and who God made her to be, she kneels before him. And for the second of what will be three times, she addresses him as Lord. Lord, help me. You know what? Jesus, touched by her emotion, moved by compassion for her poor, suffering little child, Jesus, seeing the folly of being rigid in doctrine and sticking to what God has said in the face of the real suffering of real people, Jesus doesn't bend an inch. For the first time in the story, now he talks to her. You know what he says? not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now what does he mean by the children here? Well, that's the children of Israel. And who are the dogs? It's the woman and her daughter. Now Dawn and I, we love our dog Molly. She's part of the family. In fact, if you want me to like you, start telling me about your dog, because I'm just convinced anybody that owns and loves a dog, deep down you're good people. <laughs> But I don't really need to go into detail to explain to you here, do I? That when he calls her a dog, this is not a compliment. And so this woman who had earlier called him the son of David, oh, by the way, just a, a, a moment on that. Remember that she's not Jewish. This is not part of her heritage. This is not part of her religion to understand all the messianic baggage that comes along with being the son of David, right? So she doesn't really believe that, right? She just heard somebody call him that. She's just repeating it in order to get him to do what she wants, right? Well, we find out what she truly does believe from her response to this icy cold put down by Jesus. She says back to him, yes, Lord. Yes, everything you say is true. Yes, you are the Lord. Yes, me and my people, we are dogs. Yes, we deserve nothing from you. Yes, God did send you to the house of Israel. Yes, God did send you. Yes, Lord. And even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. You are the master, Lord, and I'd be grateful just to get the crumbs from you. And everything instantly changes about Jesus' interaction with her completely. He turns, he says, oh woman, how great is your faith. And he doesn't get her name and address for the mailing list. He doesn't ask her for a donation to his ministry. But the reward for her faith, the reward for all faith, he says, be it done for you as you desire. All true faith results in the final fulfillment of what it desires and seeks in Jesus Christ. 
Now, just a couple concluding notes about this story. Of all the gospel writers, Luke is the one who goes through great pains to show that the inclusion of the Gentiles is, is part of the coming kingdom that Jesus brings. But Matthew, who, who is the most characteristically Jewish of the gospel writers, he employs the Gentiles in a different way. When he talks about the Gentiles in his gospel who are responsive to God, he's showing it as a contrast to the Jews, the covenant people, who are not responsive to God in Christ. So the other Gentiles mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew are, remember, the Magi, the wise men, who are fulfillment of Isaiah 60, the Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. And then there's a centurion in Matthew chapter 8, the one of whom Jesus says, with no one in Israel, and then there's this woman. So I think it's no accident that in chapter 14 of Matthew, the chapter prior to our story today, we learn of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And there are, do you remember, there are 12 baskets of bread left over. Jesus has this conflict with the Pharisees, and there's this story. And then at the end of chapter 15, it's the story of how Jesus feeds the 4,000 people. And you remember there are seven baskets of bread left over. In other words, these stories of how Jesus gives bread with plenty left over. In chapter 14 and chapter 15, what those bread stories do is they sandwich, if you'll allow me the pun, this story of the Canaanite woman where she gets just Where will you fit in when all the lessons of this story are finally played out in the end of history? Well, like the Jews, we need to realize there is no more special status for anybody. We keep hearing all of this political posturing about, about white privilege. Well, let me just say when it turn comes to you and God anyway, when it comes to being part of the human race, there is no privilege for anybody. There's no special status. And like the Canaanites and everybody else who has sinned, those folks are devoted to destruction. But there's one other category, and that is those who have faith. Those who believe like this woman that Jesus is the Messiah, that God sent him, that he is the only distributor of God's forgiveness and ultimate blessings. Do you see now how important your faith is? Your faith at 1 Peter 1.17 says is more precious than gold. I hope that when you came in here today, if you saw your faith as being this important, as you walk out of here today, you will see your faith as being this important. And every time you're exposed to the word of God, that you will continue to see it as being more and more important. You know why? Because the more you know, the higher it will go. The more you go, know, the higher it will go. I invite you now to join me in confessing the, the second article and Luther's meaning from his small catechism of the second article from the Apostles' Creed. Would you please stand? What do you believe? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begot of the Father from eternity, and also the true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me of the lost. Purchasing one me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocence and suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve.
Oh Lord, we pray that you would bestow upon us more and more, fresh every day, the riches of your grace. We pray, Lord, that we would experience unity in the faith, that you would preserve for us the true teaching of your word, that you would give us harmony with one another in our congregation, in our, in our synod. We pray that you would give us generous hearts, putting the most charitable construction on the activities of others and loving those around us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for those who are outside the kingdom. We pray that the word would go forth. We pray for missionaries near and far, for all the ministries of our church where the gospel is being brought to those who have not heard. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would work in and through them to plant the seeds of the gospel among many around the world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for our families, that husbands and lives Husbands and wives will grow in their, their love and faithfulness to one another. We pray for the children of our families, Lord, that they would grow in their baptismal covenants and be nurtured in the true faith, that they would be guarded and protected from a world that is filled with deceit and always trying to peel them off one way or the other, but help them stay instead, Lord, on a straight and narrow path of what is right in your eyes. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, Lord, for relief for those who are sick and suffering. We think today especially of Donna, of Glenn, Diane, Alma, Ron Kranz, Ron Now, for Arlene, for Kay, for Doris, for Pastor Morris, and for Gary, for Gaylene, who has pancreatic cancer, Little Colin, who was struggling with cancer, was doing so well and now has had a setback. We give you thanks, Lord, for little baby Hadley, for whom we pray, who is now recovering. And we continue to pray, Lord, for the families of Adam and Kim, Peter and Tammy, and the Kelly family, as all of them grieve the loss of the loved one. Lord, look upon us, and in our afflictions, turn our minds and our eyes upon Jesus Christ, who brings us the one true and enduring consolation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guide our church, O Lord, that we would see clearly before us the snares of the devil, the evil one, that we might not step in them, but rather that our steps would be guided by your plans and purposes for us, and that you would live out in our midst the lives that you designed, that we would bring honor and glory to Christ, and that they would redound one day in faithfulness to that moment where we shall step into glory with him forever, that day to which we all look forward. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. We'll continue now with our service of Holy Communion. Just a reminder, we've made some... some uh, so, some changes here, just temporary because of the virus. Rather than commuting by cable, we ask you to come forward um, by family. So as you come up, there's some hand sanitizer that you can use. Pause a moment while it dries at kind of the center station, and then receive the elements and return to your seats down the side aisle. And we'll do this side of the church and then switch and do, do the same on the other side. Would you please rise? The Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and proper that we should give thanks to you, Lord our God, for you have gathered us as one and have shown mercy to all in Christ our Redeemer. Receive our thanks, that none are cast aside. Unite our praises with those of all the faithful, and join them with the unending praise of the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven evermore praising you and singing. <laughs>
same night at which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup when he had supped, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many, for the remission of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink of it, in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Christ and through his word be on each of you over the course of the next week. Uh, special thanks to all the team that did the broad sales. Um, the number I was given was $678.50 that they made yesterday. And that's going to go toward uh, school supplies for local children. Just a reminder, we have Sunday school downstairs today at 1030. I'm really having a blast as we're working through the book of Revelation. I hope you can join us. And a reminder to the men that the men's breakfast is this Wednesday at 8 o'clock, also downstairs in the fellowship hall. Any other announcements that I'm forgetting? Then go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.